Vascular access considerations in the COVID-19 patient population. Hi, I'm Matt Ostroff, and I am the vascular access coordinator and lead clinician at St. Joseph's University Health. On behalf of myself and Sanosite, I would like to thank all of the heroes during this pandemic, the emergency medical service, the entire hospital staff from maintenance, nutrition services, cashiers, technicians, aides, physical and occupational therapists, managers, respiratory therapists, radiology, physicians, and of course the ones with the most patient contact day in and day out, the nurses. You are all today's soldiers in a war against a virus. You are all putting your lives on the line to save others, and we thank you and we will never forget the service you all did for our global community during this pandemic. My disclosures are listed on this slide. Dr. Pitarudi said, and I quote, the health emergency linked to the COVID-19 pandemic has led to a series of dramatic changes in the routine of our clinical practice requiring the review of many decision-making processes. It has been my journey that prepared me for this crisis. I flew home from Germany on September 10th, 2001 jumped on an ambulance on September 11th for my first day in New York City as an emergency medical technician. From the first day being introduced to emergency medicine, I was witness to seeing fire, police, and EMS standing together running into the storm. I saw the doctors and nurses volunteering to set up makeshift hospitals around Ground Zero. I saw the people of New York City bringing everyone water and food. American flags waved around our country and we endured tragedy together. At Ground Zero, we all ran out of supplies. None of us had masks the first 24 hours. We carried empty equipment bags, improvised flushing the firefighters' eyes with nasal cannula tubing over the bridges of their nose. But nobody complained, and nobody went home. That was the first day I stood among heroes. After six years of paramedicine in New York City, I stepped directly into the emergency department at Mount Sinai Hospital, adding a new layer to my medic experience as a registered nurse. With patient ratios of 20 to 1, we ran around triaging and treating night after night, figuring out ways to multitask to get the job done, side by side with physicians, techs, and respiratory therapists. It was here that I discovered ultrasound and the role it would play in vascular access. I then went on to become a vascular access specialist and finally expanded my scope of practice as an adult geriatric acute care nurse practitioner. I stood on the shoulders of the vascular specialist that came before me and they pushed me to learn and grow. Meeting Dr. Hickman and Dr. Broviak, hearing stories about Dr. Scribner and Tankoff, to attending the vascular conferences with today's pioneers, the ideas and techniques that I will share with you today are a collage of the gift of knowledge my colleagues have all shared with me. My objectives today are to define vascular access's role in the viral war hospitals are facing with the COVID-19 virus, to establish vascular access recommendations for access on stable and unstable patients, to describe the use of assistive tools in the morbidly obese, cachectic, and contracted patient, to examine options and alternatives when supplies are exhausted. And finally, to share experiences from a leading hospital in Rome, Italy. So hey everybody, uh, just to let you know I'm recording this in real time, I just had to go and run uh, and do three more central lines, uh, one in the ER, one in the ICU, uh, and then one more in an RRT. So, uh, here we are back, uh, and we will continue on. Signs of COVID-19 goes viral. Um, so we were running around placing lines everywhere when my partner Tony said to me that she was having trouble drawing blood from the patients. At the same time, I noticed the venous blood to be almost black. Patient after patient had the same finding, and I decided to post my findings to my vascular access group and found out that I was not the only one noticing this phenomenon. And within four days, it had reached 1.33 million people. We, now at our hospital, had a possible sign to determine COVID versus non-COVID. This also led us to examine hypercoagulability and to choose the best vascular access site based on the risk of DVT. We were finding non-compressible veins in the forearm, leading us to question whether peripheral access was the correct route. 
Communication, safety, and standardization. Globally, countries were all learning about how to care for these patients, proper personal protective equipment, how to minimize contact and yet still provide optimal care. Every hospital experienced the same learning curve. Slowly, the drips were run from outside the room. Next came the ventilators being run from outside of the room. And then creative ways to communicate with staff from inside the room with Sharpie markers on the glass, walkie talkies, baby monitors, and then labeling the rooms with the patient devices and the most vital information. But what about vascular access? The challenge seemed insurmountable with the incredible volume we were facing with patients. Our surgeons began placing lines due to the closure of the ORs, but where were we all going? What was our plan? And was there a standard of care? This is when I met with each department head and explained what I was seeing, what we could improve, how we could conserve on supplies, and how we could work as a team amongst all the chaos. No blind sticks for peripheral, arterial, or central access. The first and most important issue to discuss is the elimination of blind sticks. It is unacceptable in today's day and age to have complications with vascular access due to a lack of safety. Ultrasound has often been compared to a pulse oximeter. It is such a simple tool but mitigates such severe complications. Most physicians are surprised at the use of ultrasound to reveal the axillary vein in the deltal pectoral groove. This eliminates the practice of blind sticking the subclavian vein. Pneumothorax is not an acceptable complication of vascular access when ultrasound is available. In addition, arterial puncture can be eliminated with direct visualization of the needle being guided to the vein. And finally, above and beyond all insertion methods is assessment. The Rapid Central Vein Assessment by Dr. Pitarudi and Tim Spencer, this method will quickly determine if your route to central venous access is patent. Practitioners talk about speed and the need to provide emergent access. The solution to this is simple. Place an intraosseous catheter in a severe emergency and establish central access in 30 seconds. Stabilize the patient and then perform a safe central line catheter insertion with ultrasound guidance. Quickly, the patient type was becoming more and more similar. Obese male edematous patients. We also saw the different ranges of illness from mild to respiratory distress requiring intubation. In stable patients that are not intubated and remaining on a medical floor, ultrasound guided deep peripheral access was found to be successful. The cephalic vein in the forearm is the first option, followed by assessment of the upper extremity for the basilic and brachial veins. In an emergency, the brachial vein is always with the brachial artery in the antecubital region. Dr. Pitarudi suggests the sterile placement of a midline catheter because this provides the ability to perform a sterile wire exchange for a pick insertion should the patient require central access. Securement of these peripherals is paramount. Often, it is the patients on the medical floors that crash and are then either rapidly resuscitated at the bedside or transferred to the ICU. During transport, the IVs can become dislodged, and once access is lost, the medications cease to be administered, and these patients will pull out their endotracheal tubes. We had an incident where a patient was being transferred to the ICU after being intubated. Propofol was running, and the IV came out during transport. The patient awoke and became extremely, understandably combative, and due to his very large habitus, it took five people to keep him safe. I just happened to be in the hall when this happened and grabbed an ultrasound and placed a line directly into his AC and we pushed propofol, which saved the man's life. He was so obese that we would never have established access and while we were waiting for IM injections for sedation, he would have extubated himself. But the important ending was not that we successfully and safely got the patient stabilized. It was that I placed a central line and then removed the dirty emergent ultrasound guided peripheral to prevent a peripheral line bloodstream infection. We just finished discussing the option of ultrasound guided long peripheral access on the stable patient in respiratory distress. But for the unstable patient in respiratory distress, there is no question that the option of ultrasound guided jugular or axillary vein insertion is not a safe option for the operator nor the safety of the patient. These patients cannot lie supine or even back at a 45 degree angle. Emergent access in our facility is obtained in conjunction with sedation for intubation prior to placing the patient in the prone position. The femoral vein is always large caliber and in the vast majority of the patients, patent. 
and is an excellent emergent means of achieving multi-lumen central access by eliminating 100% any risk of pneumothorax. This site is also far away from the airway, helping to distance the operator from the airway, as well as the nurse providing care and maintenance to the site. This site also conserves on resources as the femoral site does not require a confirmatory radiograph for tip placement. Traditionally, most physicians and practitioners access the femoral vein in the inguinal crease. With the majority of the patients being obese, this region resides in a skin fold, making the insertion site the least ideal due to inability to secure and dress the catheter, as well as subjecting the catheter to higher temperatures in a region that is covered. The common femoral vein can be accessed distal to the inguinal crease, allowing for a clean exit site and appropriate dressing placement and catheter securement. This site has been well examined and researched by practitioners performing mid-thigh femoral vein central catheters. This site outside of the crease is achieved using ultrasound to locate the vein in the femoral crease and trace it distally to the thigh. It will be a deeper puncture, but the femoral vein is a very large caliber vein, and this adjustment in insertion site is easily adopted into practice. I am proud to display two of our residents who have worked closely with me and adopted this method. Here they are with their first out of the groin placement. For those uncomfortable with femoral access due to its taboo, it is easily replaceable when the patient is stabilized and intubated and sedated with a jugular or axillary vein insertion. In our experience, due to the hypercoagulability of the COVID patient, we do not place our temporary dialysis catheters in the femoral vein. Unfortunately, the progression of the unstable patient leads to acute renal failure. We have observed poorly functioning femoral dialysis catheters due to the patient's hypercoagulable state. We have not seen any issues with the jugular hemodialysis catheter insertion site so far at our institution. And to complete the trifecta of endotracheal intubation, central venous access, we have hemodynamic monitoring. Arterial monitoring and frequent arterial blood gases make early arterial catheter placement in the unstable COVID patient a key to early treatment, accurate monitoring, and medication titration. Remember that ABGs in most hospitals are drawn by the respiratory therapist, and establishing an arterial line allows the respiratory therapist to focus on other responsibilities. The adoption of ultrasound-guided peripheral vascular access is now commonplace in critical care areas such as the emergency department and the intensive care units. Arterial catheters can and should be placed the same way as an ultrasound-guided peripheral IV. Ultrasound-guided arterial access is safe and accomplished quickly. Assessment is key to this location, and this can be done by performing the Allen's test, examining the ulnar artery's ability to provide collateral circulation to the hand, should the radial artery thrombose, or the radial artery and ulnar artery can be assessed with the ultrasound as well as performing the Allen's test. Later in the presentation, I will discuss conserving resources during a crisis, but a sterile ultrasound-guided peripheral IV kit and a long ultrasound-guided 20-gauge peripheral IV catheter will provide you the same result as an expensive arterial line kit. For ultrasound-guided radial arterial access, you will always find the artery accompanied by a vein on either side. It is imperative to take into account the patient's palm when determining insertion placement to ensure that you have enough space to drop your angle as you walk up the artery. Following this crisis, the vascular access nurse's scope of practice should be considered to be expanded to include radial arterial access due to their high level of insertion success with ultrasound-guided peripheral IVs. Once the unstable patient has been stabilized, it is now safe to examine other central venous sites for triple lumen catheters, such as the axillary vein. The axillary vein is easily visible with ultrasound assessment of the deltal pectoral groove. It is in this region that the cephalic vein can be seen diving into the axillary vein and the operator will find the axillary vein become more superficial as you pan up toward the clavicular bone. This site should only be attempted by experienced ultrasound users due to the risk of pneumothorax. The lung pleura is easily identifiable, and as long as you lead with the probe and not the needle, you will be able to avoid puncturing the pleura. Often, the vein sits right on top of this. In those cases, you should outweigh the risks and benefits of this site location and judge your skill with needle tip guidance. 
On cachectic patients, entering the vessel with a long peripheral IV can provide a safe entry to the vein and allow you to cannulate the vessel and then place your guide wire through the IV catheter rather than with just a needle accidentally popping out when you release pressure from the probe. Other technique difficulties with the axillary vein are respiratory variation, which can make cannulation difficult. This is when you track your tip slowly and carefully, timing the puncture of the actual vessel with exhalation as it will collapse on inspiration. The axillary entry and exit site location provides distance of the dressing from the endotracheal tube to prevent contamination from secretions. Finally, all axillary vein insertions should conclude with a sliding lung scan to assess for pneumothorax. It is unfortunate but in our experience, the natural progression of our critical care patient population is acute renal failure. I am not here to lecture on disease process, but I will provide our device selection and placement choice. The only location that has not had an issue with flow rates or clotting has been the jugular vein. I have replaced several femoral Shiley catheters and all of our nephrologists are requesting jugular placement. And this is where assessment comes full circle. From the initial patient encounter, the severity of the disease should be assessed as the decision for central venous access is made, keeping in mind that you may want to preserve the jugular route for a dialysis catheter. Of course, a simple answer is that you can use the right jugular for Shiley placement and the left for CVC placement. But then the question comes about kissing catheters. Now, I don't believe this is a real term, but if you examine the radiograph in this picture, you can see the catheters both enter the SVC and in this hypercoagulable state, it is hyperbolized that this would have a higher rate for venous thrombosis and or catheter failure. Temporary dialysis catheters can range from an 11 to a 14 French. This is a large catheter to place on a very frail patient population. One key tip for safe large bore catheter placement is dilating up. This includes a 21 gauge 7 centimeter needle and a 0.018 inch guide wire, allowing the initial puncture to be confirmed with a small bore needle should any difficulties arise with vessel entry. It is important to be aware that the needles that accompany the TLC and dialysis catheter kits are coring needles, meaning it cuts on both sides rather than the simple beveled 21 gauge needle. Once the 0.018 wire is confirmed with ultrasonic visualization, the dilator and sheath can be placed over the wire to the vessel. The dilator can then be removed and the 0.035 inch J wire passed through the sheath. The sheath is then removed a 7 French dilator is then thread over the wire to dilate vessel entry. And finally, the Shiley catheter can be placed over the wire to its intended location. It is important to note that one length catheter does not fit all access sites. The 15 centimeter catheter should be reserved for the right jugular vein as it will be too short on the left. But personal experience is to use a 20 centimeter catheter bilaterally as it provides enough catheter to comfortably provide a smooth angle to dress the catheter. On the patient in the second picture, she was only able to lie in a ball on her right side. This access approach was very complicated but made safe through the use of a micropuncture technique. One key component to dialysis catheter insertion is how it is dressed. As you can see, a low jugular puncture allows the catheter to be dressed down to the chest or lateral or to the back as you see in the second photo. What should be avoided is dressing these catheters up the neck as the dressing cannot be maintained. There are so many factors that influence the choice of insertion site. With the majority of the COVID population in our hospital being morbidly obese, the depth of the insertion can be the greatest challenge. The patient to the upper left was 500 pounds. The physicians had attempted the jugular veins bilaterally, but were unable to pass the catheter to the SVC. It would malposition to the ipsilateral subclavian vein. After my physical examination, I noticed that the patient had a history of right portacath insertion, which could have provided some type of compromise to the internal jugular vein. The femoral vein was far beyond the depth of the ultrasound at six centimeters. The axillary vein was then examined and able to be visualized at six centimeters deep. This could make for a complicated over the wire insertion because of the depth. The patient was hypotensive. So to safely access this site, I decided to access with a five French modified Seldinger technique, which involves a seven centimeter needle to the vessel 
and then a 0.018 guide wire to be placed into the vein. But I knew that the 6 centimeter introducer would not be long enough to enter the vein and would pop out after wire removal. So I planned on dropping a 6 French 10 centimeter introducer which would provide safe purchase into the vein. At this point, the dilator would be removed and a 0.035 inch wire thread and sheath removed. The dilator was then placed over the wire to the vein and removed and the catheter thread to 20 centimeters. <clears throat> the case on the bottom was a COVID positive patient requiring dialysis access for acute renal failure. Our Shiley kits are interventional style, meaning they do not come with max barrier draping. So I use a pick kit as draping and dispose of the pick line. In this scenario, the patient had poor peripheral access as well as requiring the dialysis catheter. So the decision was made to drape for a jugular Shiley catheter and then drape the mid-thigh region for a femorally inserted central catheter. This not only conserved on resources, but accomplished the task of providing venous and dialysis access. Another option would be to simply place a trialysis catheter, but in the hypercoagulable patient, this type of catheter can clot more easily than a dual lumen catheter. Finally, the prone patient requiring central vascular access. The majority of our patient population requiring prone position is morbidly obese. As you can see in the first photo, there is no neck, meaning impossible to view the jugular vein for catheter placement. The massive chest lies heavy on the mattress, and even when abducting the arm, the axillary vein is too deep to access, not to mention it would be a virtually impossible task to perform in a sterile fashion. The upper extremities are often swollen, preventing the location of veins to place a pick line catheter in. We have even scanned directly into the axillary region in the armpit location, and were unable to visualize the vessel there. The popliteal was the next choice since accessing the femoral vein was obviously impossible when proned, but this vessel was too deep and much too small a caliber for a TLC insertion. Finally, I examined the medial aspect of the inner thigh and located the femoral vein and artery. It was six centimeters deep. Using a seven centimeter access needle, a 0.018 hydrophilic 80 centimeter guide wire, and a six French 10 centimeter dilator and sheath, I was able to safely provide access to this location with a 55 centimeter triple lumen central venous catheter and thread it to the location of the inferior vena cava. In the prone, morbidly obese patient, a mid-thigh femoral central venous catheter is a safe and viable solution for central access. Vascular access challenges at the bedside in the past pale in comparison to this new healthcare environment. We are now trying to distance and isolate ourselves from the patient while still titrating and administering medications from outside of the room. This requires incredibly long tubing, and with that, there's a finite amount of that tubing. So when a new catheter is placed, you cannot get new IV tubing as we once would for new lines. The long tubing is often getting tripped on over in rooms, which in turn pulls on the catheter insertion sites. There is no question that out of the available securement devices that a subdermal securement device is the device of choice for catheter securement. Losing access in these critical patients is unacceptable. Any patient that has this type of treatment from outside of the room with extension tubing should only be running through a central venous catheter to prevent infiltration and extravasation of a peripheral that you cannot monitor. But should you be treating a stable patient through a peripheral IV, Securement can be achieved with skin glue and a reliable dressing. In the first patient, a right jugular TLC and right jugular Shiley catheter were placed in what we call a tandem style. This approach is often used in the operating room. Due to the patient's hypercoagulable state, the catheter stopped functioning and I was called in to replace these on another obese male. Careful assessment with ultrasound revealed a patent left axillary vein. The decision then was made to place a new triple lumen in the left axillary vein, transfer the drips from the right triple lumen catheter to the left, and then remove the right triple lumen and right Shiley catheter. From experience, our hospital has had poor outcomes with femorally placed dialysis catheters. So the solution was to assess the right jugular for a new Shiley catheter placement. A location low on the neck at the base of the clavicular head was easily accessible with ultrasound. But in order to use this location, I could not have a dressing over the old exit site location. 
So I chose to place a layer of skin glue over both puncture sites and then prep the dialysis catheter for insertion. In our second picture, a pediatric patient with COVID was crashing during an intubation, and I placed an emergent left femoral CBC. It was explained to the intensivist that this was an emergent line and should be changed when possible. The next day I was called to replace this. Although morbidly obese, I was able to have my partner hold the neck up and under ultrasound guidance access the left jugular vein for a low entry triple lumen catheter insertion. The radiograph demonstrated the catheter going to the left of the mediastinum, indicating a left-sided superior vena cava or possible arterial cannulation. This was simply ruled out by drawing a venous blood gas from the line and assessing the PO2. Finally, you see the patient with the high left jugular vein puncture. This was easily replaced with a right-sided axillary triple lumen insertion. This past week, I placed 68 triple lumen, Shiley, and arterial lines in critical COVID patients. One clinician, 68 patients in a 700 bed hospital full of COVID patients. So you can only imagine how many other lines were placed by the rest of the hospital staff. Hospitals cannot afford to waste a single device. Therefore, responsible use number one is 100% ultrasound guidance for all catheter placements. This ensures needle entry, assessment of complications, and tip confirmation with scanning the right atrium and flushing for a bubble test. Realizing that an ultrasound-guided peripheral IV is the same technique as an ultrasound-guided arterial cannulation. Substituting a sterile peripheral IV kit for an arterial catheter insertion tray does not only save money, but it saves on resources. During a crisis like this with an insurmountable volume, substituting a sterile peripheral for an arterial kit can make a huge impact. Triple lumen catheters are becoming scarce. But triple lumen catheters also come in a pick line version, which can be trimmed to the desired length. They are placed with the modified Seldinger technique or the interventional radiology trays are placed over the wire Seldinger style. Pediatric departments also carry a smaller French triple lumen catheter. Dialysis catheters traditionally come in a radiology tray and are dropped into a triple lumen catheter kit. But this wastes the triple lumen catheter so it's possible to order dialysis catheters in a max barrier kit. But until then, to save on your triple lumen catheter kits, all radiology departments have draping kits that they use for all of their procedures. And these can be combined with your dialysis catheters. Finally, meet up with your vascular access teams. The pick line kits have all of the necessary equipment and even provide the option of starting your dialysis catheter with a mini stick technique. I never imagined that I would live through a pandemic. But April 5th, as the United States coronavirus began to spiral out of control, it was Dr. Mauro Pitarudi and his team from Italy that released their vascular access experiences from their crisis as one of the hardest hit countries in the world. Dr. Pitarudi has been a mentor to me and countless others around the world in vascular access. And during this crisis, he would still go back and forth with me via messaging on what I was encountering and what he had already seen. His team's recommendations and experiences matched our own experience here in the States. And I'd like to review them one more time. Number one, protect the operator. There are few vascular access specialists Therefore, if one of us go out, the expert level inserter cannot be replaced. Wear your personal protective equipment. Number two, ensure the effectiveness of the maneuver. In other words, assure that it is a safe and achievable access solution through accurate assessments and the use of ultrasound visualization and insertion tools. Three, reduce the risk of complications to the patient by choosing the safest insertion site and matching that with the safest inserter performing the procedure. Four, avoid wasting resources. Use of an ultrasound guided peripheral for arterial lines, using triple lumen pick lines when low on triple lumen catheters. Consider placing arterial lines for frequent arterial blood gases to conserve on respiratory therapist role. Femoral vein for those patients who are unable to lie supine. Stable patients receiving axillary or jugular vein TLCs. Being aware of hypercoagulability, 
the use of sliding lung sign to assess for pneumothorax, tip navigation when possible, and lastly, catheter securement. This has been my first experience in dealing with a pandemic, but being able to converse with a country who is months ahead of us, this collaboration via social media can and will save lives. This photograph is being used with permission from my patient. This patient arrived to the ER and was sent directly to the floor as a non-COVID patient. She looked awful, and my partner Tony and I looked at each other and knew she was probable COVID-19 positive. We put on our PPE because at this point, we were at a stage where the staff was only protected with our positive patients. Ultrasound assessment revealed her vasculature to be small caliber for a double lumen pick line because she needed TPN. The axillary vein was visible in the deltal pectoral groove. As I entered the vein, I looked up at Tony. I said, she's positive. Look at her blood. It was black. She was immediately placed on precautions by our staff based on these findings and her clinical appearance. When I removed the drapes, I saw her tattoo. And I saw for the first time an inspiration for our specialty, the central venous catheter under the tattoo of life. We all make a contribution to patient care, especially during this crisis. And this was the first opportunity where our hospital systems were overwhelmed with critically ill patients. And this was the opportunity for the ultrasound guided vascular access generation to make their contribution. All of the training, all of the difficult cases culminated to this one insurmountable enemy and scan by scan, safe puncture by safe puncture, we have provided these patients and our staff with safe, reliable vascular access. I would like to dedicate this webinar to all of the healthcare workers around the world, especially those specializing in vascular access. May you all stay safe and thank you.